stock obviously um i'm going to do the formal intro and then we will get going with the conversation again thank you for coming through um all right let's get going hey everyone anthony fantano here internet's busiest music nerd hope you are doing well it is time for an exclusive conversation and interview another one because we have had uh this individual on before uh, we're talking mm -hmm. to singer songwriter multi-instrumentalist producer mr jeff rosenstock whose new full-length lp uh hell mode which dropped last year uh, was my album of the year i figured that uh, made it a great idea to get him on to have a conversation uh he also just uh had this new craig before the Creek soundtrack came out, which he has involvement in as well. A new tour, some tour dates uh, behind the new record coming up, too. We're going to talk about all of that and anything else that comes up in the conversation. Jeff, thank you for coming through again. Uh, you, you didn't. Thank you so much for having me. You thanks for put, thanks for making it a little bit later so my brain could wake up. Oh, no morning. problem. No problem. I, 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 need, I needed it, too, probably, honestly. Oh, good. Is that full of coffee? Shit. Mm. Just tea. Just tea. Just tea. Just I'm, I'm, I'm mostly Bro, just trying. Just I'm, I'm, I'm a little caffeinated, but I mostly want to be hydrated. Mm, yeah, that's, that's the plan. Tea, tea hits that sweet spot. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does hit that sweet spot. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I, I want to say this, even though I, I, I feel like saying this is in order, but simultaneously, it feels weird to say it as if I had no involvement in it. But like, I, I guess, congratulations on album of the year. You know? Oh yeah! <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. How, I don't know how that happened, but like, I don't know I how that it, happened. It, it did. I guess it did. And uh, it was exciting yeah. to see. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for. I'm. I'm really <laughs> glad. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked the record. Uh, I don't know. We wanted it to be good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, I'm glad that you wanted it to be good and it ended up. We went in there saying we should try and make this one good. We've tried. We tried other things before, but what if this time? Good. What if, what if this time, really good number one yeah. album of the year? Num yeah, number of. one. Oh, it's <laughs> exciting. No, I honestly, we never expect to be on the top of any list for anybody. I mean, what uh, being, you know. Yeah, I'm. I'm just happy that you know. Hopefully, as a result of that, there's like some kind of spread or attention with the record. Uh, I mean, I, I did run across the other day. I think I tweeted this. Like, there was this um, random music YouTuber reactor channel, and it was like these three young dudes who, when I looked at their content, they mostly just reacted to hip hop. But they like put on your album. And they were like, "We're gonna react to this today because Anthony gave it number one. So we uh -oh. got to see what's up with it." And I was like, "Okay, sounds like something they wouldn't normally be checking out." So. You know, How do they like, react? The, the, I, some I of wanna... them seem to be vibing with it. They seem to be okay, vibing. Cool. They were vibing Great. with it. They were vibing with it. So, um, you know, speaking of new things, because, uh, I mean, you know, uh, we were joking around a little bit in terms of like, you know, the stuff you're doing on this album, new things, making it a number one album or whatever. But I, I do think there is a lot of new stuff on this record that, you yeah. know, you tried, you attempted, you did, and, and it made it kind of a special album in your catalog, at least to me, uh, at the end of all of it. I think, um, a lot of that kind of, uh, comes down to, uh, the, the emotional intelligence of the record and sort of how personal you got on a lot of these songs on the record. And I, I guess without maybe divulging too much, what exactly in your personal life kind of sparked this kind of like, you know, um, emotional growth journey that uh, sort of led to you wanting to make a, a, an album about it in a way? Because, I mean, so many of the themes, the emotional themes on this record in terms of personal growth and, and all that really do kind of like line up. Well, I think it was, I mean, a lot of things change, you know, like, uh, obviously, we all went through a pandemic that I, I, if anybody, I, I don't know, I, I feel like a lot of people probably did a lot of uh, self reflection during like peak lockdown times and really just kind of like, thinking about well, it, it makes you think about the future. Uh, and not necess not just in a way of like, oh my God, am I gonna be able to like go outside next week, the future? But just like, you know, you have all that time to just kind of like think a little bit. Uh, it happened at the same time that I moved to Los Angeles. So like I was I was on the other side of the country, uh, kind of with plans of like, oh yeah, I'll be in LA, but I'll I'm in New I go on tour enough and I'm in New York enough that it won't really be a big deal. Um and that was just like out here for like two years without leaving. Uh, and that was kind of intense because, you know, I have a lot, I have family there, I have friends there who I just kind of felt like I was always going to keep seeing. Um, and then uh, I guess like 
Craig of the Creek stuff really like kicked into high gear uh, or in between kind of like No Dream being written and this record being written. And that was just definitely a change because it was a like professional ass job making music all the time. Uh, and that just that, you know, just all that stuff was just so like markedly different from uh a life where like you know i was i was like you know bouncing around the city at all hours of the night or like l working in like a tiny like queen mattress size room for like 10 or 12 hours a day on craig of the creek or like on my own demos and just like you know those tight new york apartments um and and also just like not really knowing what the future is going to be uh like as far as like my life goes because i'm in a band and that shit can just end like at the drop of a hat you don't know you know um so it was this change of like okay well now i i, I live somewhere else i miss people but also like i'm not crammed in like a fucking room where there's just like synths and guitars like eating my head all day mm. long i'm just like spitting her out play this one play this one uh it just like you know feel a little bit more comfortable but then also feeling that while like i'm watching the world just like burn down around me like not not even just like i not even just pandemic stuff uh but like watching just like w watching how social media as over the last like five years has really uh, five or 10 years, like really brought like racist police brutality to light where you're literally seeing videos. And especially in 2020, where we're like having protests, we're watching videos of like the police state, like in action, like kettling people in on bridges in New York where they're protesting because they're out past this pandemic curfew. They could like attack them and shit, like right. crazy things happening. And then also, literally, where like that same year, uh, it was a pretty bad wildfire season right. out here, uh, and it was, and it's the first time I've ever experienced anything like that. So there was just like a lot of a lot of different a lot of different vibes versus like New York, where it's crazy all the time. But like I'd been there for like twenty years, uh, so you know, it was just like all this all this different crazy shit, and and we were all going through it at the same time, and then also like. It's kind of how do you abstractly think about that instead of think about it in terms of like COVID-19 is here. Like, how do you how do you think about it in a way that like feels like it it is it it's it's like, you know, addresses more than just like the specificity of all those situations. So I, I think that's maybe why there's more there that that reach is like that. You know, I, I don't think any record personally is like more vulnerable or less vulnerable or personal than mm -hmm. the one before it or anything. I think maybe just like also like you make enough records or you say enough shit, you just got to dig deeper into like this stuff that's harder to talk about sometimes. Mm. You're just like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> then then and then you're there and then you put the record out. You're like, boy, I hope hope people don't say this sucks. <laughs> um you know, in, in the midst of all this, like, kind of change and, and maybe to a degree isolation because of, you know, kind of like the, the, the way that you've moved and the place that you kind of ended up in, like, how do you end up with, uh, like, an anthem, for example, where you're talking about, like, establishing boundaries and pushing people away when you're feeling hurt or you're put in a position where, you know... Um, you've been betrayed in, in some sort of way, you know, for example. Uh, that song, you're talking about Graveyard Song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, that song was hard. That song just took forever to figure out what the hell I was trying to sing about um, because there's just, there's a lot in there. There's a lot, there. there's some personal stuff in there just about like, you know, people over the course of my life that I've had to feel like, you know what, I can't fuck with that person anymore. Uh, and it could be tricky. And this isn't like necessary. And yeah, th that stuff's hard, but it's hard to like advocate for your own like mental health, for lack of a better way to put it, but just be like, you know what, like, I'm not like if, if you're kind of like a people pleaser -y kind of person, like I, I tend to be like, you know, you always really, you can let yourself be a punching bag. Uh, 
And I think that song is, you know, a little bit about trying to not be that personally, but also it's about just like trying to not be that like as a whole, as this generation, like I, I there is a lot more specific stuff in there that I was thinking about, about how like people uh, can't like, can't get behind like addressing people with their preferred pronouns. And in my mind, a lot of it's just like, why the, like, what the fuck do you care? Like, let somebody be, let somebody be happy. Let somebody be themselves. Like, why the fuck do you care? Um, and I didn't want, I, I couldn't figure out a way to like really talk about that without it feeling really explicit and really kind of like ham fisted or whatever. Hmm. Um, but like a lot of that thought was in there too. Just like, all right, man, if somebody like it, like, if we have this chunk of the population who just like cannot accept people for who they are, like fuck those people. You don't got you don't got to deal with those people. You don't have to have respect for those people, like if they do not have respect for you. So I think there's a lot of that stuff, and I think like all of it being a song, like graveyard song, is kind of me trying to essentially say like fucking bury that shit, like be on the right side of history, like like you know move forward with things, stop clinging to this ideal of the past. And especially like with just, uh, and I, I don't, you know, I, I, I know I go down political roads from time to time and I'm not trying to like do that super hardcore right now or anything like that, but just the fact that like we have so many like octogenarians like representing us in government and not listening to the things that we're asking them to do. Uh, this song is also just like, man, I just I want like let us give us give us the wheel, like give our generation the wheel, like stop taking it away from us. Stop skipping over us. Um, I don't know if it all really comes through in that. I don't know if that was all just the journey to this song or if it's clear, but like, that's where uh, that's, and this one just took a long time because like talking about any of that stuff, it's really hard to do without feeling like explicit or feeling like you're really trying to exploit like tragedy for the sake of like, oh, cool. I got a good stanza out of this. Right. Nice. You know, yeah, I mean, as it, it, it's it's a difficult balance to walk sometimes because as somebody with a platform that sees various injustices happening, you want to say something, but simultaneously it is a balancing act because you don't want it to come across in such a way where uh, speaking out against this is my brand and it's yes, my means yeah. of making a living. <laughs> and, and then it sort of like becomes almost exploitative by virtue of that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that gets that gets put on me sometimes, too, mm -hmm. um, because I am outspoken about things. Um, and then that almost like starts this thing where I feel encouraged to not speak out about it because I don't want to be, you know, like that kind of, I, I don't want it to be my brand. It's just how I feel about things. You know right, what right. I mean? Uh, it's interesting to try and like express yourself in a world when people are looking at you. And I think when you make a record, you got to like turn the blinders on a little bit to that and try and just like forget that that is happening. It's a lot easier when people are not listening to your records, uh, but it's a lot easier to be in a band when people are listening to your records. So that's kind of the trade off, you know, I, I, th I think a little bit of it in a way has been kind of poisoned <clears throat> by the social media economy because uh, now everything that you say and do can be monetized to some degree depending on like where and when and how you post it so you know it's it's almost yeah. like kind of poisons the well when you open your mouth while it is good in a sense because it does spread the word about things and create conversations that maybe would have gone completely ignored in a world yeah. of traditional media it does kind of create maybe a lot of cynicism in some people who I've had conversations with who are like oh well you know this person who I might know personally who's expressing a genuine point of view, I might hear by way of another person, oh, they're just saying that because they want retweets or whatever. And it's like, no, I mean, I, I know that person, you know, they actually do feel that way. Um, yeah. But, and, yeah. And, and to be fair, like, I, you know, I don't think it's a good thing that I feel discouraged for saying things because people might perceive it as me trying to do it as my brand because I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I should really just, you know, I, 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 that person should say that shit. And if that person and if that other person is like, oh, that's just their dude on social media, like, what the fuck does that matter? That person doesn't know. The only person who knows is the person who's saying it. You know what I mean? Right. And also I'm like, did I monetize anything? Is there like a big pile of money sitting somewhere? 
Like, is there a comp troller? Is there like a Twitter comp troller that's going to send me a letter and be like, Jeff, you've got like $640 sitting here from your tweets. If there is, I'm, I'm waiting for some, some checks. You'll get 10% finder's fee. Don't worry okay. about it. You'll get 64 bucks. My $56 from Spotify, your $64. And, we and we'll, we'll add it up. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we'll buy a Webby. Moving on from there to maybe more of like a, a big picture kind of like career uh question and topic I, I wanted to ask you now that you've kind of like gone further down this road of, of not only like extending your discography but also like kind of getting further into uh the world of you know soundtrack music and you know working for like visual media and that sort of thing like how do you feel like these two different modes of creating are affecting you as an artist generally do you feel like you're in completely different worlds as you do one or do the other or do you feel like they kind of come hand in hand together i don't know if this is a bit you know presumptuous to say but i mean you're you're certainly not the uh you know first uh you know rock or rock or pop brainiac to kind of like make a bit of a transition into that world you know you you have your mark mother's boss you have you know they might be giants and so on and so forth i mean i'm not saying you're going to be doing the hot dog song for disney or anything like that <laughs> is that what they, i was like is that what they might be giants do yeah yeah they, they did they you know obviously they did the malcolm in the middle song but you know they also oh, right, did a, yeah. they, they also did that hot dog hot dog hot diggity oh. they, they did that song too they, they've, they've written some mickey mouse clubhouse bangers um but you know the thing is uh uh for for some people at least uh that world almost sort of seems to be their focus but I think as this yeah. has kind of moved along you've been able to kind of successfully maintain a foot in both in both worlds creatively and how do you feel like that's kind of you know moving together or separately or whatever at this point um creatively is kind of interesting uh because like I think no dream was the one that I guess hell mode hell mode and no, no dream were, were both happening simultaneously with Craig of the Creek um, but like I would work on those things when I had long breaks from the show. Hmm. Um, the process is, and, and no dream was different again. Cause like a lot of that was like worked out on tour and I thought about it a lot. Whereas hell mode, I did kind of like go up to the desert to start working. I like just kind of isolated, got an Airbnb, uh, up like near Joshua Tree for like four or five days to demo songs. And I had all these ideas of songs in my head. Um, but it had been so long since I'd really shaken them out, so to speak. Like I had done all that 2020 dump stuff, which was cool uh, and I'm proud of. But then there were also a few uh, a few demos from Helmo that happened around then. And then I didn't do, I felt like I didn't do much of anything for like all of 2021, just Craig. Uh, so I didn't really know if I was going to be able to do it. And I was stoked when I started working on demos and it was good. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure. Like, I don't, I don't take for granted that like songs will happen again. I think that that kind of changed my perspective because Craig of the Creek was very much like, it's a very full-time job and it's working like 12 hours, not always 12, but like eight to 12 hours a day, just like constantly like writing music uh, and like looking at picture being informed by what you're seeing and trying to like create something to that and it's really cool it's really fun it's really chaotic it's just like you're just like all right let's just go it doesn't matter if it's good like like i do like a junk pass it's like all right doesn't matter if it's good just get something down and then go back over before i send it in just like fix everything try and make everything good and then it's like whoo i worked real hard on this for three days let's go on to the next one there's 40 more episodes to do this year uh versus like a song where you know it takes like, I don't know, like how like there's songs of this like liked you better. Like I've been working on that song since fucking worry. Like mm -hmm. there's so like songs sometimes take a really long time to just at least for me, just like kind of like grow and make sense and be like, okay, well, I have this thing, but like the verse sucks. So like until a good verse pops in my head, like, I don't know, I'm shit out of luck. So uh I don't know if it's like that's kind of the difference. In it, I think that Craig has really like informed me to believe that I could do different kinds of things because the show like required it. Mm. Um, and I think that's caught into my music at all. Am I have I have I made it really far away from your initial question at this point? No, no. I mean, I think you're actually kind of leading into my next one. I wanted to know yeah. like how much. <laughs> 
how much you feel like at this point with also having the soundtrack under your belt right now, uh, do you yeah. have a better sense of like how these two different modes of creating kind of influence each other? I mean, obviously this is a project you were invited into with the knowledge of like the type of music you've made. So like, you yeah, know, clearly you're doing different stuff. You're trying different stuff, but there's at least an expectation, a baseline expectation of maybe like what the vibe generally might be given what you've put out in the past. But, you know, simultaneously, you know, now that you're at this point, are there moments where you're doing or trying or expanding your musical palette through your palette through your work with Craig and then you're finding ways or sort of like, you know, maybe thinking like, oh, maybe that's something I could try here on my own record, you know, oh, that, yeah, that, for that I sure. sort of have picked up here. I wouldn't have done if I didn't try this. It's it's interesting because you don't I feel like hell mode almost was like a reaction to 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 doing all that stuff and like all like say like the cinematic music that has been made for Craig with like, you know, or like virtual orchestral instruments and stuff like that. Um, and hell mode, I like there's barely a piano on the record. Like it's a very like guitar, bass, drum, synth record for a lot of it. Um, I think like the the impetus to make that really streamlined was almost like a, a reaction to like having kind of like very maximalist stuffs uh, ain't during that era of Craig of the Creek. Um, and I think since doing the movie um, and now having like like a literal movie score that was orchestrated, that had an orchestra play it, that had a taiko drum ensemble play it, that was like music that I wrote mm. uh, and that like I played with my band. Like, I think now that I have that under my belt, I'm thinking a little bit more about like how to include those kinds of orchestration with my music. Um, but also I'm like not trying to shoehorn anything in. Hmm. Uh, I think that like, I think, so like it's in there and I feel, I feel cool about it. Like I feel, it's weird to be like, it was funny after it was done, just like, you know, talking to Benny from uh, Gaslight Anthem and who plays drums in Anarcho Vespucci a little bit about it and just being like, okay, well, if you guys need like string arrangements for your records, I could do that, I guess, because I just did it for this movie score. Like, it's kind of, it's cool to know that I could do it, but I also just don't want to do it for the sake of doing it. Mm. It's always just kind of like, I don't know, what informs a song. So I don't know if like that, if it's like the instrumentation, I think all the Craig stuff has kind of like encouraged me to stay punk because that show is very like kid energy a lot of the mm. time. And I think like a lot of like, like remaining faster or getting faster and faster is something I always wanted to do uh, as I got older. And I think the show really pushed me into doing that, which is a way that has shown itself. And also just like, I, I'm constantly in the creative flow. Like there isn't like a, there isn't a lull. I mean, there is now because show's over. So who the fuck knows? But like for the last like six or seven years, it you know, it was never. It was just like, yeah, man, the taps on and the water's blasting out. Like, let's go. So you know, it's yeah, been that, cool. I wonder how it's going to be now. <laughs> that leads into another thing that I wanted to to ask you. Like, how do you feel at this point, especially with this album being as like detailed and dense as it is and you know you're kind of getting into this world of arranging through you know the craig stuff uh but simultaneously this new record uh still has a very you know aggressive fast as you said like punky rowdy feel um you know was it kind of difficult working through that process of kind of maintaining that momentum and that intensity and that ferocity while also kind of like piling everything on top of you know, uh, these, these songs that you were demoing? Because again, there's a lot of layers, there's a lot of details, there's a lot of changes, but you know, through all of that, it still kind of remains explosive. And maybe sometimes, you know, at, at least with uh, other bands who are sort of like, you know, maybe punk artists of age, um, you know, th there could be a lot of layers and a lot of detail, but maybe there ends up being sort of a sterility there when you end up kind of getting the final product and it doesn't hit as hard, you know, where, whereas like, sure. you know, especially with this new record, um, there's still kind of a punch to it. I, I'm... I'm I'm glad you feel that way. You know, I yeah. I like mu I'm a music fan. I like music. I I when there are bands who I like who start putting out bad records, I am sad about it. So I really try I try to keep I want to keep that energy there, and I th I think that that's something. Bless you. Uh, I've I'm trying to think like 
I don't know. I, I like bands that manage to get better as they get older and manage to keep that energy. Like if they, I, Super Chunks, Majesty Shredding. I think about that record all the time. How like mm. they disappeared for 10 years. They came back. They put out they like they put out their best record. They were already like a legendary band. They're like, oh, what's up? We're back. Oh, yeah. When somehow we're better than ever. Um, and I th and I don't know. I think about that a lot. I just. Also, with like the layers and being fast, I, I like. I think I've. I think it's all. I've always made music like that. Like that's yeah. not. That's not different from like the that last ASOB record, Three Cheers for Disappointment, which is I think when I first kind of like sort of figuring out how to what exactly what I was trying to do and and just feel okay trying it. You know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, I just. Th uh, I think maybe I don't know on, on this. I think as. I kind of go through this, like making these records that are like g these giant piles of, of like instruments on these songs, like uh, maybe just on this one, trying to let the, it's cool. I'm glad you feel that way. That means that the details shined through. And I think, I think as I was learning how to do this and I, this doesn't say one's better or one's worse, but I think, uh, a lot of the, I, I think on maybe earlier records where I was doing this kind of stuff, it was just like the details were like coming at you like a like a fucking wall. Mm. Uh, and uh, I don't know. Um, I think keeping up the intensity though, like I have more of a problem not doing that. Mm. Like I have I have more of a problem being okay with like my slower songs and more of a problem like, you know trying to like figure out like the way to write something quiet and pretty and slow without make it feel like something that you want to like you know cry and sit in a corner and listen to because i i feel like the fast songs you already want to cry and sit in a corner to listen to so it's like i can't can't do that with the slow ones too i don't know <laughs> uh, i feel like in a sense with some of what you were getting at and and this kind of ties into you know one of the big refrains with the closing track on the record it, you know you sort of put out this message about or this insistence um with staying young and i you know yeah. I, I feel like you you know you were digging into that a little bit at least in terms of like how the music kind of manifests like how does that work for you as like i guess a philosophy you know or like an idea how do you feel as a guy who is you know north of 40 at this point uh, how, how do you feel like you continue to be a youthful individual what does that mean in terms of your creative process or everyday life what is a youthful perspective or way of being 40 plus as opposed to maybe you know an older way of being because i'm sure at your yeah. age you're, you're, i'm sure at your age you're seeing other people and i mean i'm i'm close to the same age range you are yeah um and and i see it as well i mean you know i'm sure you run into people who are 40 and they just kind of seem to like not really care anymore or they're not with it or they don't even try to sort of like be aware of the state of the world or there's kind of like a passion sapped from them in a way. And I feel like what kind of keeps that fire still lit in, in you? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, I, I try to not think about it. Although like once you hit 40, it's hard to not think about it. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, I I think also a lot of people who I know who are around my age, they all have like kids and stuff. They they have full blown families a lot of the time, you know. Um, so they're they're focused on that. I think do, my do, friends do, do my you think age that's who it? don't Pro is procreating the killer. <laughs> what? Is, 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 <laughs> yeah, is, you're is, like I is, pro I think it's is just procreating like, the killer this, the moment you pop out a kid, it's just like you're you're dead, you're done. You're, well, you're just like I got shit to do. Like I can't. No, I don't think. I definitely don't think you're you're dead when you got a kid. But like, you know, you like that's you like a kid is going to take up like eighty five percent of your time as mm. as your child should. You yeah. have to raise your child. Sure. Uh, um, and I think like you know, I don't know. I can't speak to having kids. I don't have kids. Mm. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know. There's never like a switch that like is going to flip in me. That's going to make like the way I feel about life differently. Mm. So it's not like I get like, sure, I get older and I get exhausted with feeling that way. Um, but like, I think that like that exhaustion sometimes is what drives you to be like, I need to, I need to get this out of my system. I need to, I need to write, you know, just kind of like shake that anxiety off, just try and figure out like what's a productive use for all this negativity that I'm feeling inside me. Um, 
And that's kind of how that's how I've written songs a lot. I think as I get older, I want to find ways to write more and more that are not from that place because I'd like to not always feel so negative, you know. Um, but uh, I, I think that like as much as I'd like that, I still feel stressed out about a lot of stuff in my life, about tons of stuff in the world, and the world just everything just seems to be getting uh darker and bleaker and more like i imagined it when i was in my 20s and reading like you know chomsky and just being like oh fuck man <laughs> it's, it's all going to like life after the oil crash dot net and being like oh shit it's coming you know like it like none of that stuff that ever like for a better term radicalized me into thinking the way that i do mm. like all that stuff is pretty much proven to be true so it only gets more stressful as you see it happening so uh I, and then you know it only for me it just makes you care like i can't like turn it off like and you can turn it off but it doesn't go away so when you turn it back on it's like right there so i don't know that age has anything to do with it uh i think that that stay young until you die lyric at the end of three summers was kind of like that song in general to me is just kind of like about like what where like pursuing your passion for a long time takes you and is that a positive place or is that a negative place um or not even that not as fucking black and white terms as that but just like what what does it leave you with like does it leave you happy um i a lot of that song is about uh a, a friend and a peer and someone who I'm a, who I, I was a big fan of, Jack Terrycloth from World Inferno Friendship Society, uh, who passed away over the pandemic. And I was just like, thought about how many times I'd seen that band and how inspiring they had been to me to like, not only make music, but just to like be okay with being my true freaky self sometimes. You know what I mean? Like going to those shows when I was younger was really like, was really special and really important to me. Um, and I wonder, and I, I would just find myself like hoping, like, I hope he felt that. I hope he felt that what he did was good and what he did was worth it. Cause that's a band that like never really tried to be commercial or anything. They were just doing their thing. They had their fans uh, and it was cool. Um, and so that lyric to stay young until you die is also was kind of like a seven is a seven seconds quote. Um, and I think about how that song uh, on on the crew, like uh, like listening to as a kid and then thinking about it now um, and just kind of like I also I wonder I wonder how Kevin Seconds feels when he plays that song. I bet he feels great every time I see Kevin. Every time I see Seven Seconds when they're older, they're like still awesome. And I'm just like, this fucking rules. You know what I mean? Uh, anyway uh long answer kind of a non-answer i'm doing good <laughs> no you are you are doing good thank you um okay <clears throat> you know uh you you i i feel like this also ties into another lyric on the record where you were kind of flirting with the idea of like you know almost like uh giving up or you're almost like you know on on, on this bit of a a, a fence sitting moment where you know you could continue caring and continue focusing and continue like you know having a, an emotional investment in the state of the world or you could just like turn it off altogether um yeah and you know to sort of put a pin in it and be a little more specific on that topic like on most days like on what side of that spectrum do you feel like you mostly <laughs> land on because while while obviously it requires a lot of effort to stay engaged and continue caring simultaneously for you specifically i can't even imagine what giving up would even look like like you know it seems like that emotion kind of wells up within you regardless of whether you want it to or not and yeah. giving it up or, or turning it off isn't really an option yeah, I don't think it's like giving up on the emotion. I think it's giving up on all. I, I I feel like I wake up on the on the middle of the fence every day, and I could go either way. Maybe when I'm on tour, it's not really the same. Like when I'm on tour, I'm like, cool. I'm about to see my friends in the van. We're about to play a show. It's going to be a nice day. Um, but uh, I don't like. I I feel like there's maybe a little bit of a fantasy to like giving up and just like fucking off to the middle of nowhere and being a hermit and just like not talking to anybody again, living off the grid and just not dealing with it. Uh, but I think the reality of that is uh, lonely. And the reality of that is you're right. I, I would, I would still be doing it. Like, I, I think 
that's that's a true and weird thing about me is that like no matter what what is happening like i am just like writing songs for myself over here so i don't think i would ever land i don't know if i would ever land on the side of like okay i i care so little that like i'm not gonna think about music or i'm not gonna write or anything like that um and i i don't know i'm just i'm i look I I am I think I'm just a empathetic person for better or worse um and uh you know I I I always land on the side of like I care but uh you know I I'd say like every, it's a toss up every day whether I'm like well I wish I didn't fucking care though it seems easy to not care you know what I mean mm -hmm. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about one thing that you wrestle with a couple of times on the record. And, and I know early we were kind of joking about the idea of like selling a million albums or whatever, but like, yeah, you know, still, it seems like at least to some degree on this album, there are moments where you struggle with, I guess, like at least for what you so far has been your own success, you know? Sure. And, yeah. you know, you sort of have a hard time processing that and you sort of compare it to the bleaker parts of the world or the, you know, greater inequities in the world that maybe a lot of people are kind of blind to or ignoring. For you personally, does that come from mostly a place of like, I'm seemingly doing well while others are sort of like suffering for pretty much no reason when it's unnecessary? Does it also come from maybe like, maybe an old school punk mentality where sort of like, you know, the vision of like, you know, making it in this genre means like, you you know, you're living in a fucking squat somewhere or something yeah. like that. Like, you know, where do you feel like that comes from for you and how have you, where, where are you at this point in terms of processing those feelings? I'm more used to it. That's for sure. Um, I think it, none of it really comes from like this place of like, oh, I'm not going to be punk anymore or anything like that. Um, because I don't, nobody cares about that shit anymore at all. It's like, it's like two, it's 2024. Nobody has any money. Everybody's just like, okay, well, if you got, if this is like your thing, we are going to get paid. Like, God bless you. Like, please get some of it because it's just some money that like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk don't have. Right. Um, I think uh, it, it it was like, it was just weird. It, it, it felt weird because it was a pretty quick shift to like being uncomfortable and being comfortable. Um, like I think the band started doing better at the same time the Cartoon Network job happened. Uh, and before that I was like doing graphic design sometimes and producing like occasional records, which like, you know, I had like four or five like jobs that didn't bring in much, but together, like they brought in the rent. Um, and then it was like immediately like, oh, OK, like I'm 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 chilling right now, uh, which is nice, which is a good feeling. It's good to not it's like I'd be lying if I said it's not nice to, you know, not have that pressure anymore. Um, but also, like, I don't really necessarily feel like. Not like I deserve it, but like I think where that comes from is just like I think capitalism is weird. I don't think it makes sense that like somebody who, who has one job or does one thing is making is making enough myself is making enough that like I can live in a house that has a basement that has a studio in it while there's people in my city who are living on the streets or people who like just have like minimum wage jobs and are like struggling to pay rent. Like, I don't think it should work like that. I think there's this, like, I think, uh, and like brace yourself. I'm about to go into stupid person territory, <laughs> but like from what my understanding is, is that like the economists that make decisions for our country, um, base it on this position that you have to have a certain amount of people who are poor. You have to have a certain amount of people who are homeless um, or else the economy collapses and like everything goes wrong. And I think if you look at like, I know that like, if you look at studies from like how people did when they got uh, financial assistance during the pandemic, uh, how there was some study I looked at the other day where they I've, like, I've, gave, I've seen that gave, same gave study. The they unhoused. gave like 500 a month and a lot of them ended up, uh, you know, obviously the stereotype is that, well, if you just give them a bunch of money, uh, they'll just continue being homeless. They'll spend it on drugs. They'll yeah. just be lazy. But they actually found giving many of these people 500 a month, they found a place to live. They actually got a job. 
Yeah, no it, fucking shit. It, it seems so mean, obvious. Yeah, it gave them the means to just lead a normal life. Yeah, I think we're like, and this isn't really about the song anymore, but like, because all these fucking things are in cahoots from like the media that reports on this stuff to the banks that have the money, um, we're conditioned to believe that like, yeah, they're going to go spend it on drugs or go to do like some nefarious shit with it, where it's just like, no, people are fucking stressed out when they can't afford to live. Right. Um, anyway, uh, so it yeah sometimes it feels like unfair like yeah i get to afford to live like what the fuck did i do you know what i mean um and i think it comes from that place i don't try and beat myself up too much about it and i've gotten a little you know more used to it and i appreciate it very much uh you know i don't know i it was kind of just like wanting to be honest also wanting to for some stupid reason be vulnerable when i'm writing songs and like what is like what would be the hardest thing to write about if you're in a punk band is like, all right, let's write about how like, cool, uh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I would joke with, uh, Christine, my wife, that, uh, what the song life admin was my version of, uh, the song top of the world. Uh, you know, the song I'm talking about is like ludicrous. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say his name T I cause he sucks. Uh, but you know, uh, great. I don't know. And we listen to that. So we listen to that song a lot of the time. Uh, a lot of the time we listen to that song a lot of the time in our twenties. Uh, but like, that was just like a car banger, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. and I thought it'd be, I was like, all right, well, this is if somebody had like, uh, felt enormously conflicted about doing about like one, one thousandth as good as like ludicrous or or TI are doing at this point in their lives, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing. And I think a bit of, um, uh, and, and look, I, I understand where it comes from, uh, when, when people sort of like, will maybe look at, you know, the amount of success ludicrous or like, you know, TI is having, or that even you are having and sort of, you know, obviously in a direct comparison to your average person, you're doing pretty great. You know, but there's like a vast sort of gap between that and, you know, again, what someone like Jeff Bezos is doing. And I think like for yeah. the average person, there's this like, you know, incredible or it, uh, simply because you don't understand how the other half lives. There's this blindness to like how crazy of a spectrum that is in terms of like you literally have billions of you have more money than anybody could ever spend. You own the means of production. And, you know, that is like that is that is the rich. That is like yeah, that's know, the, that is the class of people sort of like controlling things. You're just somebody yes. who's seeing success off their art. You know, you're, yeah. not, you're not like dictating how politics works. You're not using the money that you make to buy off uh, senators, you know? No, but, but I am at this. I, I'm getting money from like uh, it was Turner before that. And now it's Warner sure. Brothers. And it's these people who like the person. And it's always crazy to me to think about how like, I don't know if I could if I could be feeling like I'm doing well off of working for them. How much fucking money are they bringing in? all right. the time it's like an impossible amount uh and there's just i don't know there's these gaps man like you see it with like bands touring and stuff like that too like there really is like not much there is not much it's a huge jump from like when you start like doing good touring and then like the tour before that you'll be making like 350 dollars a night to split between everybody mm -hmm. like there it, like the middle ground in so many places doesn't exist which is a shame because i think like that is where everybody would be more comfortable and people who have a ton of money would still have enough money to live and then i don't know i think about it a lot capitalism the way we're doing it don't work <laughs> uh, some of the commentary on your record in terms of like some of the stuff that you're saying socially there does also seem to be like a bit of um, an admission that for a lot of people, maybe to lead a comfortable life or, you know, a more peaceful life, it requires kind of silence and ignorance. Um, it, you know, as you kind of like, you know, maybe climb up the ladder in a, a little bit in the way that you have been sort of, you know, working with more soundtrack stuff and, you know, working in visual media, does that sort of like give you pause sometimes in terms of like how I'm going to dictate my regular life, what I'm going to say on social media, what I'm going to say in a song or whatever, because, uh, you know, what if somebody who is some, you know, exec somewhere takes it the wrong way or whatever, thinks I'm too this or too that. 
Um, I th I've thought about it a lot, uh, but nobody ever has. Uh, I think the show I work on, uh, worked on in particular, Craig of the Creek, um, from top to bottom, from like, you know, any like from the interns on the show to the people with titles like producer, like series executive that I was that like would scare me. Um, everybody has always just been really, really supportive of what I do and excited about what I do. Um, ben, who is one of the creators who hired me, like has very like he's he's a fan and he's he knows everybody knows. I, I've asked him before. I'm like, so it's fine that like I'm saying all this shit and he's just like yeah it was fine don't worry about it so you know i feel like just keep I, and then i feel like well okay well that's cool because like i don't know i don't have to like pretend that i feel differently than i do and then like potentially there's and then and i think this with our whole crew like there's people out there who have what I believe is a good perspective and we're being encouraged to share that, whether that is through the show or through what we talk about. Um, and we have eyes on us and really nobody on the show has like cowered from that. Like in the entire crew has been like, okay, I got to like tone it down. <clears throat> like the furries are more furry than ever. Uh, like everybody just goes hard. It's cool. So I think I'm just in a really good group. I don't know. Uh, well, I don't know what any other situation would be like because this is really the only one that I've been in. But I, I feel really fortunate that this was a situation I was in because it did feel like I found a lot of kindred spirits who were working on this show who really like that doesn't like what I'm saying on the Internet doesn't move the needle because there's probably somebody else on the show saying something weirder or more hardcore than me at some point. You know, you're telling me that as you've gone woke, you haven't gone broke. Is, is, that, uh, is, that what, is that what you're telling? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying to me right now? Uh, I I don't even know how to reply to that, Anthony. <laughs> that's, that's that's fine. That's I got fine. nothing. All right. Um, As I've gone woke, <laughs> tell me a little bit about the um, uh, tour dates and about stuff being... that you that you have uh, coming up. I know you're going to be going out on tour behind the record soon. Oh. I don't know. We're going to the UK. We're going. To, what do yeah. I tell you about it? Okay. Yeah, I mean, what? Yeah, let we're going to Ireland in the know. UK. Yeah. Shows are going to be fun. We're okay. going to play songs. Uh, we've been playing bas basically everything everything off hell mode on the nights that we are allowed to play for that long. Okay. Uh, we're going on tour. With good bands. Shit presence. Fucking awesome. Uh, we're doing a US a small tour. Not a small tour. We did we went we did this tour with Sydney Gish and Gladdy um in September and then I got COVID towards the end of it and we had to cancel the last week and we we're just like, okay, well, what uh I, I was just bummed. I was so sad to do it. So I was like, well, maybe I could just convince these bands to like when well, we do make updates to do like an extra three weeks of shows. And I texted both of them and immediately they're like, Yeah, cool. Um, so we have this uh tour in march and april with sydney gish and gladdy that has some makeup shows from when i got COVID on tour like a dummy uh and like two extra weeks of shows in like the midwest and uh the northeast and canada and stuff um but yeah i leave fucking saturday for that ireland uk thing that's that's gonna be fun it's cool shows have been shows are really good over there last time other members of the band got COVID on that tour we ended up finishing it out, just me and Kevin, our drummer. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a safe and healthy tour that we finished the whole thing of. It's kind of crazy to be out there doing this uh, while being a human who cares about not wanting to spread COVID. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, it has, has that sort of like changed things pretty radically in terms of like... You sure. Know, I, mean, I mean, there's some artists who I'm sure depending on you know, the size, I mean, it happens. They don't even say it because they're afraid of sort of like, you know, obviously tour insurance and not being able to kind of like cover all the cancellations because, uh, some yeah. of those companies don't cover the fact that you've, you've gotten COVID. It's, it seems pretty preposterous. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I felt really grateful also it, during all of those COVID things that we went through. Like I felt really grateful that we were in a spot where we could handle it mm. financially, um, where it didn't like break up the band. Like I've definitely been in, like, I feel like, like my first band, like 
we would get like things that would happen like if tours would if like shows wouldn't go good or like if something we were doing went bad it was just like okay well we can't do anything for a while got to work and save up money to do something again kind of thing mm -hmm. um so i felt really i feel really lucky that we can do that uh at the same time, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know what to tell anybody to do, but it's wild that they're, I don't know. It, 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 to me, it, it seems, uh, to me personally, I feel like I wouldn't be able to like have it and be out there and know that I have it and just like not, not check, not test, still play. Um, I don't know, but it's a, uh, it's a it's a crazy world we live in and i know we're all just trying to get through it the way that we can so i try to not really even think about how anybody else is doing it anytime we talk about it in the van it is a long conversation where we're all like ah, ah, you know but then it also just seems obvious like if you feel like you have covid tests and if you have covid don't play you know hmm. i don't know all right jeff thank you for coming through being an open book thanks oh what, what a great note to end it on yeah no i mean well you, you made some larger comments about the ladies world and gentlemen and, and i there's this <laughs> virus out there called covid we all know uh, i saw this fucking thing popped up in my news feed the other day that was what? like disease x have you heard about this Oh yeah, like, as a concept, yeah. Disease yeah, yeah. X, like more more deadly than COVID, and it spreads super fast. I was just like, oh Jesus fucking Christ! I thought we were getting through this tour; it was going to be easier. And then I looked, I was like, this is a hypothetical disease. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. just like, how am I? How how is anybody supposed to believe anything anybody tells any of us is a fact or anything? No, we live in a crazy world of the information crash, and it is it's something. <laughs> oh no it, it is something i mean you know i don't know if uh, uh you have any sort of like you know opinion as well and kind of like the i i think pitchfork has kind of been you know a, a sign of this like the increasing death of like old media websites where you could just kind yeah. of like go on a site that you presume has like you know some sort of uh uh editorial process and maybe some research behind the articles or things being posted and it's not like ai generated an actual human yeah. wrote it and nowadays it seems like things are again more ai generated more just mm -hmm. existing on social media people's news feeds aren't an actual news site it's instagram and yeah. I, I think that's kind of like you know poisoning the well even further than it's been before to a degree yeah for sure and i don't i mean you know i i, I think that it's easy to feel like all right i'm an old man shaking my fist at the clouds kind of thing yeah uh but like it's just it's just sad it's like i i feel really bad for all those all those writers like and it's just like i don't know i don't want it, it's good to have a human involved like i don't i don't think ai like gets me ai thinks that my favorite band is the cure because my alarm clock is boys don't cry and like granted the cure is great but like i'm it's not like it's not like i'm like a cure obsessive it's just that's my fucking alarm clock uh it's just uh i don't I don't, it sucks. I'm not looking forward to it. I know that the reason for it isn't any sort of thing for a music listener or somebody who enjoys watching movies or animation or anything. It's just so, you know, the consolidation of power could continue and the people at top can make more money by not paying people because they have to report like quarterly, uh, you know, increases, increases for their shareholders every quarter. Uh, and that's not like sustainable and it's very scary that like the place that it's going now is like taking jobs away from creatives. It's very like it's a very scary thing like being in uh, the world of animation and seeing it happen and just like knowing that like the CEOs, uh, I don't know, like that they would that like people hear about people saying things like okay well soon enough in like a year or two we won't have storyboard artists and we'll just have ai do it or like we won't have writers we'll just have ai do it or like what they already do is they have ai write it and then like two writers go in and make it human or whatever um ugh, i don't i don't want i don't want to watch that shit like i don't want to watch like fucking i want to watch serpico and i want to watch spirited away and i want to watch like i want to watch cool stuff that people like thought about you know uh i don't i don't know I, I think about that mario brothers movie and how it seemed like it was written by ai and there was no like actual plot uh just a bunch of things that like trigger you to go like fool the green shell uh and like a future where that is 
what things are. Uh, and we have, we have a million of those movies and like no poor things, uh, would make me really, really sad. Mm. Speaking of uh, Spirited Away, have you seen The Boy and the Heron? Yes. Yeah. What did you it's think great. of that? It was great. I I, saw, I, I want to see it again. I want to see, I got to see it soon. I want to see the dub. I saw I saw it with subtitles uh, right when I got back from tour. Uh, I really liked it. I was also a little drowsy because I'd just gotten back from tour. So I want to see it again. Uh, but yeah, it's great. I think it's I, something, uh, I mean, I, I love his movies, uh, and I really like that he didn't show anybody any of the movie uh, in Japan, at least before putting it out. I thought that was fucking cool. Um, and I thought, yeah, I love the animation of when uh, the boy is running. Uh, it's just really like, re just like really, really like so much movement in like these runs. Uh, yeah, I thought it was sick. I, I uh I think, uh, you know, we've been we've been given a gift by being able to, like, watch Miyazaki movies or, like, you know, listen to, like, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard or, like, there's some or, like, there are people who just keep putting out just, like, bangers and it's sick. Greta Gerwig, like, there's just, like, a lot of, like, good, good stuff coming our way. I want I want it to keep I want to keep relating to things and having things resonate with me instead of having a, an algorithm figure out what they think resonates with me and then showing me like, here's a song by the cure about disease X. Uh, here you go, buddy. And an, like, an right, AI generated I song. Yeah. And yeah, an AI generated song about that. I'm like, X. okay, it is kind of catchy though. <laughs> you know? All right. I think this is a good tease for our future political and art critique podcast. <laughs> that, that'll, that'll happen yeah. once what we're doing currently goes belly up. So just, just yeah. keep, just keep me on, just keep me on the line. Hey, if there, if there's anything that's going to survive this, it's podcasts. Yes, true. Exactly. <laughs> White guys talking on podcasts. Sure. Sure. Get us on there. They're like, they're Put like us front and center. Finally, we're like cockroaches. <laughs> we just thrive no matter what's going <laughs> we, on. We're still here. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. All right, bye.